The early 20th century saw an unprecedented wave of fascism and authoritarianism sweep across Europe and the world. Country after country fell to these totalitarian forces. First, the Bolsheviks grabbed power in Russia, only to have Lenin die and have Stalin turn the Soviet Union into an oppressive dictatorship. Then Mussolini installed himself as the fascist dictator of Italy, and his coup was followed by Hitler and the Nazis rising to dominate Germany. It seemed as though authoritarianism was unstoppable, especially with the lack of any resistance from the Western powers, which preached democracy while continuing a policy of giving into every demand made by the increasing number of power-hungry dictators. And in 1936, it appeared that the stage was being set for the next totalitarian victory. The fascist military of Spain was ready to have their own coup d'etat. And unfortunately, the Spanish Republic was following the lead of other Western powers by attempting and failing to appease fascism's desire for power through concessions and negotiations. This failed, and in July of 1936, the fascists struck. Uzumberto Marzarachi described in his book, Remembering Spain, every bourgeois house, every club premises or premises of capitalist bodies, every church, was converted into a fascist redoubt from where machine gun and rifle fire mowed down the populace and their hundreds. In cities all across Spain, the military claimed the country for themselves. The Republic, realizing too late the futility of their attempts at appeasement, was utterly unable to resist the revolt and had to stand passively by while the military began to seize the country. However, not all Spaniards had adopted the government's passive stance on fascism. Many left-wing trade unions, realizing that the military would not be appeased by any concessions from the government and that the government was not going to actually stand up to the fascist threat, had begun preparing to resist the uprising themselves. One such union was the CNT-FAI. After General Francisco Franco took over Spanish Morocco as the first stage of the coup, millions of workers went out on strike and each trade union organized workers into militias to resist Spain's treacherous army. Much of the CNT support was located in Catalonia, especially in Barcelona where the fascist uprising was thwarted in a mere handful of hours. After seizing weapons, taking back the garrison, and securing the city, the CNT-FAI organized militias which were dispatched to other Spanish cities to ward off the fascist insurrection. The fighting was intense and ferocious. As George Orwell described in his memoir, Homage to Catalonia, men and women armed with only sticks of dynamite rushed across open squares and stormed stone buildings held by trained soldiers with machine guns. Machine gun nests that the fascists had placed at strategic spots were smashed by rushing taxis at them at 60 miles an hour. Thanks to these efforts, many other areas and cities were saved, including much of Aragon, Asturias, Irún, Valencia, and the capital, Madrid. Overall, due to the rapid response of the CNT, FAI, and others, Franco was only able to take over a third of Spain. Two of the main cities in Aragon, Saragossa and Huesca, were taken by the fascists thanks to Republican delays. In order to take back these cities, a column of militiamen was sent to Aragon. The column was named the Druti Column, after Buenaventura Druti, the most famous fighter in the unit. In explaining the significance of the revolution, Druti once said, quote, We're giving Hitler and Mussolini far more to worry about with our revolution than the whole Red Army of Russia. We're setting an example to the German and Italian working class on how to deal with fascism. Along the way to Aragon, the militiamen encouraged local peasants to take over the land in a process called collectivization, which I'll discuss shortly. Additionally, many peasants volunteered for the militia in order to help fight against the fascist threat. In fact, so many peasants wanted to join that the militia had to start turning people away so as to not depopulate the countryside. After sweeping through the Aragon region, the troops arrived at Saragossa. Unfortunately, the government of Saragossa had delayed too long, and the workers believed the government's promise that the government could stop the fascists, so the unions weren't prepared to deal with the uprising. Because of this, the fascists had enough time to fortify their positions and were ready to defend the city. However, the militia was large enough that they could have taken the city back, except for one problem. They were running out of weapons. While the Soviet Union was supplying arms to the communist militias, they refused to give the anarchists, such as the CNT, any weapons. Because of this partisanship, the militia was never able to take Saragossa. This bias quickly became a chronic problem for the Republican or Loyalist side, and especially for the CNT FAI. With countries such as the US, France, and Britain refusing to give aid to the Republic, only the Soviet Union and Mexico were supporting the resistance against fascism. However, Mexico could only send limited arms, which were inferior to the supplies that the USSR was sending. This gave the Soviet Union a virtual monopoly on aid, which gave them the opportunity to strong-arm the Republic into acting in accordance with the desires of Moscow. The Soviets used this power to attempt to suppress and disarm the CNT, FAI, and other organizations which they were affiliated with. However, the CNT resisted this suppression and stood up to the Soviet Union, 
in addition to taking on the combined fascist forces of Germany, Italy, and Spain. So while the democratic Western powers stood idly by while authoritarianism swept across Spain, the CNT-FAI was on the battlefield and in the streets defending democratic ideals. Despite the militia's failure to take Saragossa, however, the Druti column still had many successes. They liberated numerous villages and smaller towns throughout Aragon. As they freed these rural populations, they encouraged the people to collectivize the land and resources. This meant taking the farmland that had been abandoned by the landlords and having peasants cooperate in farming it, with the community as a whole owning the land. This allowed for greater equality for the poor people of Spain, since they were no longer kept in poverty by the half-capitalist, half-feudalist economic system of Spain. While people often talk about the wealth inequality in present-day America, the problems of today have nothing on 1930s Spain. As explained in a pamphlet from the Workers' Solidarity Movement, quote, The division of land in Spain was the worst in Europe. A massive 67% was in the hands of just 2% of all landowners. In 1936, 10,000 proprietors owned half of the nation's territory, end quote. However, there were just 5 million peasants who owned little or no land. Thankfully, the collectivization of the land redistributed roughly two-thirds of Republican land to the people, and between 5 million and 7 million workers participated. This process greatly increased production. The process of collectivization, however, was not limited to the countryside. In Barcelona, many of the industries were operated for the benefit of the public instead of for the bosses, and instead of exploiting workers, the workplaces were managed by workers' councils. Industries which were collectivized in this way include the transportation system, power companies, factories, mines, mills, and the food industry. In Barcelona alone, over 3,000 businesses were placed under worker control. This collectivization improved the lives of the working class people by providing for them in a way that Spain's feudalist capitalist hybrid had failed to do, and it protected workers from the exploitation and the harsh working conditions that they'd previously faced. As the pamphlet from the Worker Solidarity Movement said, with the profit motive gone, safety became more important and the number of accidents was reduced. Fares were lowered and services improved. In 1936, 183,543,513 passengers were carried on the trams. In 1937, this had gone up by 50 million. The teams were running so efficiently that the workers were able to give money to other sections of urban transport. Wages were equalized for all workers and increased over previous rates. For the first time, free medical care was provided for the workforce. Now, it's time to explain why the CNT took the course of action that they did. As I said before, the CNT-FAI was an anarchist organization. Now, when I say anarchist, you likely think of a bomb-throwing, chaos-loving purge participant. However, what anarchism is portrayed as and what it actually promotes is entirely different. On the most basic level, anarchism calls for the abolition of any hierarchies which are unnecessary or immoral. For example, the CNT FAI felt, and showed, that bosses are unnecessary in the workplace. This is why they collectivize industry, since they felt that the boss-worker hierarchy was unnecessary, and immoral since it exploits workers by taking their output away from them and only compensating a very small portion of it. Other hierarchies which anarchists disapprove of include the government, the patriarchy, and the capitalist education system. These two came under attack from the CNT-FAI. While the CNT eventually joined the Republican government, they only joined to promote anti-fascist unity. However, they still called for limitations in the government and continued to push for collectivization in rural areas. In addition, they drastically improved the position of women in Spain. While under the old system, women were oppressed and overlooked, the anarchists took steps to improve the condition of women. While women had often suffered from diseases such as syphilis and were offered next to no help, the anarchists began educating people on issues such as these and were able to reduce the spread of STDs. Furthermore, to promote gender equality, the anarchists did not discriminate on who was allowed into the militias. So women fought alongside men in large numbers and played a major role in helping quell the initial uprising in many parts of Spain. Additionally, the anarchists replaced the factory-style production of knowledge and children that tends to happen in capitalist education with a system which lacked the student-teacher hierarchy and encouraged children to explore what they were passionate about. While it might seem that no learning would occur in such an environment, the system actually works surprisingly well. The following quote is from Manolo Gonzalez, in which he describes what it was like in the collectivized child care he was in during the Spanish Revolution. The collective child care was run as an elementary school. In our school, the children organized the curriculum. Art and culture, as our parents had taught us, were our most intense passions. We sang, we wrote reports on the classics, we acted revolutionary plays and demanded films. We demanded history. We traveled all around Barcelona. Transportation was free, so we went to factories to be near the workers and learn how to run machines. We went to farms to see the land reform. 
we visited museums. This revolutionary new method of education was yet another of the contributions made to Spanish society by the anarchists of the CNT FAI. Sadly, the revolution eventually failed with the triumph of the fascist side in the Civil War, though not, it is important to note, because of any internal shortcomings of the anarchist and socialist organization of the Catalonia and Aragon regions. This experiment in reorganizing human society is still very instructive in showing what is possible through dedicated organizing for a better future. Thank you for making it through my first ever video. If you disliked it, be sure to give it a thumbs down, and if you especially disliked it, be sure not to subscribe so you never have to watch any similar content from me again. A special thanks to the Spanish people for having a revolution so I could talk about it, and also for fighting fascists because that's probably somewhat more important. I'm considering whether I should do another video digging into various aspects of the revolution in more detail next, or whether I should read some old pamphlets audiobook style and give commentary on the parts that are relevant to the present day. Let me know what you think in the comments, and have a great day.